Hello there, everyone. Welcome to a brand new Digital Foundry Direct Weekly. And yes, this is the show where we discuss the latest in technological advances, the new tech news, discuss the content we're covering, stuff that's going on in the DF Supporter Program. And as usual, I'm joined by a number of guests. And we shall begin with John Linneman. Rich, how's it going? There's a lot to talk about today, I would say. It's one of our most packed uh, episodes, in fact. It is packed, yeah, lots to talk about. And um, next up, Audi Surly. How's it going, Rich? Are you ready for some FSR and some DLSS? I'm ready for all of the acronyms that you could possibly throw at me. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> moving on. Do you on. know CDI, the most important of acronyms? I am aware of it. Um, I'm trying desperately hard to forget it. But let's move on swiftly to our final contributor, Alex Battaglia. Hey there, Rich and everyone else. I'm happy to be here. And I do once again have sparkling water. Well. Well, that's all that matters. That's it. Thank Please like, subscribe. Thank you for watching. <laughs> uh, but no, we do have matters to discuss. And we're going to kick off with, uh, I think, the biggest story of the week, because people keep talking about it. Uh, AMD's Fidelity Effects Super Resolution. So we've got our video up there. Uh, everybody else has, has theirs up there. Embargo is lifted. Games are out. Uh, quite a lot of controversy, uh, which is kind of weird because I think AMD have been extremely open about what FSR actually is. So why don't you just give us the highlights here, Alex? All right. So um, I guess I would say the highlight uh, from our coverage uh, concerning this was initially when you do comparisons of FSR and its various quality modes, and let's start with the ultra quality mode uh, in a 4K presentation game. Uh, if you turn on an FSR, you will notice uh, that the inner uh, kind of edge quality, as in texture quality, the details within textures is lowered. And things like transparent edges uh, of geometry or thin wiry uh, geometry or detail will also be lowered when you turn on FSR. And this, um, this kind of detail lowering happens uh, more significantly when you lower the FSR mode from ultra quality to quality to balance to performance. The one aspect of SSR, FSR that seems very convincing in its initial outing here in 1.0 is how it uh, tries to preserve edge detail even though it is rendering at a lower resolution. So if you look at the edge of a geometric object that is opaque, you can see uh, actually that the edge looks still actually surprisingly 4K-esque uh, when you look at it. And that is something that does uh, look less convincing when you go down in the mode from ultra quality to quality to balance to performance. Um, as part of, that was like the main takeaway from the initial part of our video and the highlights of it. The second part of it uh, is asking a more, I would say, theoretical question about what FSR's purpose is in a PC games menu options. Uh, it's kind of there to replace the ability to upscale an image um, from like the usual way we upscale very dumbly in games. And there I found it a very convincing kind of uh, technique to use. The thing is not every game is going to just have very dumb upscaling options. And a lot of games like those from Capcom, Ubisoft, uh, Frostbite will probably have it soon enough. Unreal Engine games will have something called a temporal ups sampling or temporal upscale. And this is kind of the controversial part, I think, of our coverage because we kind of come to the conclusion that FSR should not only be in a game if you can also have temporal upscaling. And I would say that is the preferable option for people who have lower end GPUs or for those who prefer image quality. Uh, because it will perform nearly the exact same. Uh, it will have the same amount of overhead to that original rendering uh, as you would see in FSR, but will produce superior images from every single, um, I guess I would say, internal resolution that is possible because the very nature of the technique is very different, which is probably the core of this controversy is that um, there seems to be a general misunderstanding or a misappraisal or a, a certain... I don't know what it is about what FSR may actually be. Well, I think it's pretty straightforward because they've released everything to do with how they do it, right? It's an edge enhancement technique um, that seems to be combined with uh, what they're doing 
with uh, CAS, Contrast Adaptive Sharpening. So essentially, rather than being a competitor to TAA and DLSS, I think something we need to point out here, I'm looking at the reviewer's guide here, and there, there are no comparisons in the reviewer's guides to any temporal solutions. Um, it's all against native rendering. That is basically AMD's uh, sort of point of comparison here. And um, I, in fact, I've been going through the marketing, maybe in some interviews they've mentioned DLSS, uh, or, uh, but they've never really mentioned temporal solutions. This isn't really seemingly what the, what the comparison point is for AMD, but it is a comparison point that's up there. And if we talk about the way that image reconstruction has um, kind of uh, advanced over the years, it started with spatial um, anti-aliasing solutions and it kind of ended, I guess, at SMAA. That was kind of where things sort of dropped off. But then again, SMA, SMAA, the way they improved that was to add a temporal component. Um, <laughs> and then from there, we had the PS4 Pro era where basically a four teraflop, fairly uh, mundane, mediocre GPU, uh, judged by PC standards, was being asked to deliver a 4K presentation. And basically every single solution that worked involved a temporal upscale of some solution, whether it's checkerboarding or, uh, yeah, which we've seen work to spectacular effect in, uh, I guess, again, the most celebrated example from my perspective would be Insomniac's uh, uh, upscaler uh, that they use in Spider-Man, Ratchet and Clank. So, you know, I think the fact that AMD aren't talking about uh, anything other than native resolution comparisons, we should take that at face value. That's what they're comparing against. And I think, to be fair, we've seen again in the console space where, um, you know, PS4 Pro, Xbox One X couldn't handle native 4K. So they did render at lower resolutions and upscaled with techniques that I think were probably less effective than FSR. It was just like, you know, straight upscaling from, say, 1620p. And it worked. So, you know, this is kind of like an evolution of that and um, not a kind of um, comparison to DLSS or, um, uh, or temporal ups ups upsampling. So I think that's, that's kind of like, you know, it's basically a different fork. AMD have kind of gone back to basics here. They've basically um, decided, well, you know, nobody else seems to have examined this spatial upscaling uh, situation so we're going to do it but you know there are other solutions I think is what we were saying in the video and based on the 1.0 and we should stress it is a 1.0 implementation then um, you know those temporal solutions which are tried and tested which you know we've got five years of development in them now they're looking pretty good Alex I something I want to ask hear your thoughts on is like looking at the results here I'm kind of even wondering like is there even the need for a spatial solution at this point uh, in time? Like, I mean, fundamentally, like the the only benefit I, I really see is like this is a way to get upscaling without compromising HUD resolution, which I guess is similar to a resolution slider in the first place. So it's basically like a resolution slider feature where you're rendering at a lower resolution and upscaling internally, but it's done slightly differently or the results are slightly different. But I feel like it's weird at this point to be focusing on a spatial upscaler in this day and age. I mean, what do you think about that? I think it is surprising that AMD took the technology in this direction based upon <clears throat> the rest of the trends in computer graphics um, about how to get more information out of a photo <clears throat> or an image, I should say. That's the surprising part. Um, uh, it does seem, uh, I think them going for the spatial direction too also conflicts a bit uh, ideationally in people's head when they think they want this to be a DLSS competitor, they want this to be an image reconstruction technique. Uh, but based upon what it's doing, it really cannot be. Uh, and that's a, a big part of my, my coverage after the fact as I'm trying to talk about it to people online is to say, AMD in their, um, also in their tech uh, review guide, they show um, FSR very smartly against and uh, point upscaling, I believe as well too, because that is actually the thing, uh, the solution that it is kind of, or the things that it should be best compared against. That is where it's, that's where its innovation is at. And that's where I think it is most powerful as a tool. 
So I think it is a little weird that they went in this direction, but for those games, for example, that do not have temporal anti-aliasing or do not have the ability for some reason to have temporal anti-aliasing upsampling or upscaling as it's called, or DLSS or checkerboard rendering or any other type of reconstruction technique, then this will produce a better image uh, for a non-linear upscale to 4K, um, usually. There are some caveats with that there though, because um, the way it's trying to find edges, this technique, uh, and we can throw up an image here of Godfall. And if you stop an image and you look at the internal texture detail of both the very naively upscaled image and the FSR one, you'll see that there's actually slightly less internal texture detail in the FSR image. That is because is yeah, it is, be it is because FSR is trying to find edges and it, it, it is doing it in a naive post-process manner. So it will technically blur over some aspects that maybe do not need this weighted blurring. And as a result, you can see a lessened texture detail at times. They try and uh, mitigate this by adding in their contrast, contrast adaptive sharpening into the mix. But once again, contrast adaptive sharpening is not adding in detail that a 4K image would actually sharpening have. Sharpening doesn't add detail. It is, sharpening doesn't add detail. It increases local contrast, which is why they call it contrast adaptive. So that's the thing though, is I'm thinking like, that's what, what, that's what I noticed from looking at the high quality versions of your shots is like in many cases, just a normal bilinear upscale can actually look slightly better overall in terms of like preserving texture detail to the point where uh, I'm wondering if you just use a simple upscale with it, a different sharpening uh, method, how that compares to FSR because uh, I mean, it'll produce different, re different yeah, results. Yeah, it'll produce different results. But maybe perceptually um, sharper? It depends on which one you're using. Some of these um, upscalers do emphasize certain different types of sharpness. Um, so yes, I think that's my key takeaway from a lot of this FSR controversy, and I'm really sad it, it is controversial, is that it should be best compared against the bilinear by cubic lentils, whatever point sample filters, uh, where it is actually the innovation. That is where it is really interesting. But if, if you compare it to other things that it's not trying to be, it is not trying to be an image reconstruction technique, I don't think, like we see with checkerboarding, DLSS, TAAU, then it, that's when the, it falls apart. I was gonna say, based on all of this and everything we've seen then, it seems like AMD was pretty much on the up and up with this and like all these weird expectations and arguments are just from the community itself, like somewhat misunderstanding what it's trying to be, you know? Well, well, I think what it's trying to be is basically a way to get extra performance, which is what it well, does. But that's, that's um, what's, what's different from that to just lowering the resolution in the first place. It's just another way to lower well, the resolution yeah, but and upsample like... There are, uh, you know, the, the edge sampling and upscaling stuff is is actually quite interesting, I think. And that isn't what you'd get from a standard uh, scaler. But what I will say is that um, uh, there are already a big bunch of temporal solutions in the PC space, uh, probably not as many as in the console space. But in the PC space, I can name two examples that are really good that you should check out. So first of all, Flight Simulator, turn on TAA, 70% resolution scale at 4K. Um, it's like um, 15, 12p internal. That's lower than FSR at ultra quality. And it looks pretty good. 80% is, uh, is pretty much nigh on native quality. Uh, secondly, the Division 2, similar technology. Um, that, that's looking really good. I mean, the latest uh, UE4 uh, TAAU is to the point, is to the point where it's defeating pixel counting it's that good it's very difficult to even tell <laughs> it is extremely yeah. difficult to tell yeah. uh what resolution the latest U ue4 scaler is actually operating at and we've been doing this a long time <laughs> so well done, you know, at that point <laughs> well done <laughs> so yeah you know getting those metrics it's it's you know extremely difficult and but that is what happens when you have five years of iterative development on a a technique that's just getting better and better. And to be fair, FSR is on 1.0. It's yeah. still got a long way to go. Like you mentioned earlier that for SMAA, they inserted a temporal component. There's, it doesn't seem like there's anything stopping from AMD doing the same, right? Like, 
No, not at all. And I, in fact, so I got a number of messages from developers, not people just in the tech press sphere or whatever, but actual people who, someone, for example, who worked on very successful checkerboarding implementations, one that even fooled us into being a native presentation at one point. And they were saying, uh, first of all, thank you for the coverage. Uh, it was good, by the way. And uh, also that they find it weird that there is the impetus from both the tech press side and from the, the, the user side to want to compare this to image reconstruction technology. Um, th they see this as an additional point that can also be taken and used. For example, there's nothing stopping a developer from taking the idea behind the edge enhancement, the way it kind of tries to make the edge look 4K-like, um, and using that at the end step or as a middle step point in another temporal solution. So there's not FSR in its current state though, I don't really consider it very much so image reconstruction. But with certain additions, like we see other developers did in the past with SMAA, this could become something very competitive and very interesting. Just right now in 1.0, it is more similar to an upscaler than it is image reconstruction. Okay, so let's just uh, answer a few questions here we had from the community because I think this kind of sums up some of the confusion that's happening here. But I think, you know, bottom line is AMD have got a really good FSR page that explains exactly how it works. So do check that out. But first of all, um, question from Michael Goydane. Uh, what existing AA technologies does FSR most resemble? Sounds to me like it's most like MSAA plus a smart sharpening pass. I don't know about that because the very nature of MSAA is that it has multiple samples, which FSR doesn't have. Alex? For me, FSR, uh, I said it in the coverage, but I maybe should have spent even more time on it. I just thought it was intuitively obvious after I said the sentence, um, is that FSR is not anti-aliasing. Uh, if you were to feed it a raw image, it would, first of all, probably not find edges very easily at all. And it would also just reproduce that extremely aliased edge in some sort of weird filtered way and native resolution, which you can see, by the way, in the games that uh, have FSR in it currently that use TAA and you stop a frame, you can see what FSR is doing and it doesn't look right um, because it, it needs anti-aliasing. FSR needs some form of anti-aliasing to work at all in the first place. It is not anti-aliasing. The closest thing that it is maybe similar to would be there was SMAA 2X? Uh, that came out at one point in time where it would take MSAA samples and modify them with SMAA, kind of try and make a gradient in the or in the that was already there created by MSAA. That is maybe what it is most similar to, but even then, it is not similar to that. But it is not anti-aliasing at all. It's not it anti-aliasing. That's right. Weighted edge blending, smoothing, mm -hmm. kind of. That's what. That's right. the way I would term it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and a question from Jonas. <laughs> it's always the surnames that get me. Uh, Tagizade. Sorry about that. Um, do you agree with others in the tech press that FSR is better than DLSS 1.0? Is it always worse than TAA upsampling, or could it be better in some game engines? Well, from my perspective, uh, DLSS 1.0, um, it could... Basically, the effectiveness versus, na uh, versus native with 1.0 seemed to be down to the effectiveness of whatever the TAA solution was. So um, when we looked at Final Fantasy XV, that demo that they did, it could resolve detail that wasn't there because it was replacing TAA, which smeared it away. But there were clearly some cases where it wasn't, where it was clearly... A much lower resolution. It was easy to pixel and count as we, well. That's the key. It was easy to pixel count, which we said at the time, you know, okay, this is 1440p. Uh, this question of um, quality, again, we, we are not comparing like for like, but I think it's fair to say that uh, when we looked at Metfo, I'm looking at your Metfo video, Alex, um, DLSS was 1440p to go to 4K and it had some advantages against 1440p, but they were kind of offset by this kind of blanket blur that was added. Per, that's precisely everything. Like DLSS 1.0 is interesting in that it was able to reconstruct some level of detail 
um, and I had an example from Shadow of the Tomb Raider where it actually completed lines that were subpixel that TAA couldn't resolve. And that is interesting because it was starting the exact same image. Um, I think that's the interesting part of DLSS 1.0, but its ma major failure was how it had a painterly look, at which we always laugh at. It just made things look blurry and had this weird like edge detail that almost looked like someone drew it. Um, and also the fact that it was uh, performance intensive. It would take off like a certain millisecond of the frame to be questionably better than its native internal resolution at times. And that was its big problem. As a result of that, I would say FSR, uh, from an implementation standpoint, is more successful in its initial outing because it costs less and is less intrusive, but it doesn't mean it's doing the exact same thing at all. I don't think these are good comparison points. And we didn't talk necessarily about trying to make comparison points for, for non-comparable things in the video for this exact same purpose, because we don't have a game with DLSS 1.0 in it, and we don't have a game with FSR in that exact same instance to actually compare against. It would be interesting if we could, but they don't also do the exact same thing, so I don't want to compare them. Ultimately, that's um, what it is. It's not, these aren't comparable things. They're not trying to do the same thing, so. And uh, the collector has a question here. Do you see a path forward for FSR 2.0 to provide significant improvement to image quality while maintaining its ease of integration and universality? Is there a way to achieve consistent quali quality across titles without deep learning or per title hand tuning? Sounds to me like we already have a solution and it's temporal super sampling. Yeah, that's, yeah. So th I think that's their next um, innovation for them will be to add a temporal component into this. And then it'll become an image reconstruction technique as I call them. And it'll be probably have more quality if they do that. Um, but at that point in time, uh, game engines will already have TAA in them. And what is the purpose of adding in a an external solution that does the exact same thing as yours. Well, it may well be the case that, I mean, it, it all depends on what the performance characteristics are. And um, that's that's kind of about it, really. Um, I do think, though, that um, if they do add a temporal component, it's going to need motion vectors, at which point the ease of integration kind of slots into line with DLSS. It does. Yeah, it does. Um, at that point in time, it really does. So the ease of integration uh, to incorporate motion vectors would actually make it harder to integrate. I think that's the bottom line. Um, any more questions? Let's have a quick, a quick look at this. Um, is there any way that DLSS can actually survive when the competition is inferior but cheap, easy to integrate, and it's not competition. universal compatibility? It's not competition. Uh, well, no, uh, I don't know. <laughs> this this is a hard one because there's a there's a premise in there that I don't agree with in the first place. But uh, I guess I would say history's uh, the technique that advances in history is not just based upon uh, whether it's cheap and easy to implement. Always, um, TAA won out, and it is extremely um, temperamental and requires a lot of tuning. Uh, it's much simpler than just slapping on FXAA, which is cheap and everyone can do. As, a, as an aside, for people that really want to see what happens when trying to tune TAA to work and it breaks apart, go check out that video I did on the Surge 2 a couple of years ago. Because later in that video, uh, there's a lot of footage of them experimenting with their own TAA solution and showcasing all the situations where it completely breaks. Uh, which is really fascinating to highlight just how difficult and temperamental it can be to get right. So worth looking at. I think this is a, an interesting point, the whole open thing, because we've actually been advocating for a while that DLSS should be direct ML and work on all systems. And that um, just just the fact that AMD um, supports it, you know, on RDNA 2, you would actually be able to run it. But NVIDIA would still have a competitive advantage simply because they've invested the money into the um, uh, the, the, the deep learning silicon. Um, but that said, from a corporate perspective, from a, uh, from NVIDIA's perspective, um, they do dominate the GPU market. And, you know, developers clearly like DLSS because it's getting integrated in more and more titles. 
Um, I think what they're trying to aim for, you know, um, on the corporate side is to effectively corner the market on AI, on deep learning. And DLSS is basically a flagship product on that. So if you can consider it as kind of like the AI version of CUDA, you know, CUDA is basically a universal language now that NVIDIA owns that AMD is really having trouble competing against. It's interesting, Rich, by the way, I think, um, because I do think talking to many developers, just looking at the future, uh, I think machine learning is going to be so important for the future going forward. And it's something that uh, I hope AMD is working on right now to like really take seriously, because I feel like this is something that needs to be there going forward. Yeah, I guess the other thing is that, you know, people were kind of hoping that FSR could be uh, good for consoles, and it will certainly work on consoles. But so, again, no temporal, reason, tem you know, basically, yeah, the, the existing solutions, especially at low resolutions, you know, Series S would not work well with FSR because FSR gets better and better the more base resolution it has. And Series S doesn't have a whole bunch of that. So I, I need, I need to, that's another clarification point, by the way, because one thing, <laughs> Uh, people keep asking for different levels of, okay, Alex, we can talk a whole about a bunch of things right now, but I compared in the video temporal anti-aliasing upsampling at 1080p internally versus FSR internally at 1080p. And uh, we can talk about that in a second, but the entire purpose of that is to show that regardless of whatever input resolution you're at, the very nature of the temporal technique gives it more information to play with, to reproject into the current frame, to make it higher quality. If you increase or decrease the base resolution, you'll just see varying degrees of that. And as you increase the internal resolution of two images that are using two different techniques, they will start to converge at some point. So if I were to compare TAAU at the ultra quality setting, by the way, that FSR is at internally 1622p, they would be more similar to one another but the entire purpose is that TAAU would still be superior because of the very nature of how it works. You're, you're like, uh, I think people really want to once again change the like or misunderstand what FSR is doing to the point where you <laughs> no matter the way you compare it to any of these reconstruction techniques, it's always going to fall apart because it's not trying to be them. It's not trying to be a reconstruction technique. I don't think. And AMD themselves have not pitched it as that which is that's important to note uh this this is entirely down to users and and uh, people out there misunderstanding what it's about uh, possibly yeah but i think there is also the fact that people kind of are looking at dlss and realizing that it opens the door to making stuff like ray tracing playable at really good frame rates and they kind of want the same and i, I don't blame them to be honest I, I agree but you know it just comes down to how all of, everything we're talking about is just uh, how can we render natively fewer pixels while still producing an attractive image on a high res panel. Uh, I mean that's that's literally fundamentally that's everything right now. It's just figuring out how to make a final image look good, and there's many ways and, to yeah, solve while it. While we're talking, exactly, and while we're talking about ray tracing, the fact that it is drawing on, um, you know, fewer pixels to upscale. Uh, it basically means that if you use FSR in a, quite a lot of ray tracing techniques, the ray count will be going down. Therefore, therefore, the noise you get on ray traced effects will be going up. And we actually see that in DLSS to us, uh, to you know, quite noticeable in some titles. Yeah, we we do. The, the so there's one other thing to clarify, I think, and I'll just come up with a, a little mind experiment example, just so people in the audience can maybe understand what I'm You're saying. You're playing mind I'm, games. <laughs> I'm playing mind games with the audience. Uh, the difference between something like what TAAU is and what um, FSR is can be thought about if you imagine a, uh, what do they call those, like a mesh fence, you know, like those with those like with those geometric patterns, like those kind of mesh fences, and you put it a certain distance away from the camera so that the, at the resolution you're looking at it, uh, the real resolution you're rendering at, all of those little mesh uh, wires start to disappear because they become smaller than the size of a pixel. Now, FSR taking that image and trying to blow it up to 4K would never be able to capture those internal little mesh rings of that fence. It just cannot because it is not, it doesn't, reconstruct the image from previous frames and jittering it and offsetting it and doing all these things to try and get that detail. TAAU, on the other hand, or DLSS or checkerboard rendering even, 
could actually reconstruct those little mesh wires. And I'll probably end up make, having to make an example of this and post it somewhere just so people can get the idea down. But they're just two very different techniques and TAAU for most gamers will be the superior option if it's in a game. And that's why I was so adamant in my review to talk about TAAU because I think it's a great technique and I think gamers should want that in addition to FSR. It, this is not about saying don't in implement FSR. It's about saying, well, please don't forget TAAU. Uh, when we talked about, you're talking about machine learning and deep learning. Uh, when I worked in Japan in 2016 uh, in the visual novels uh, sphere, uh, we started implementing that back then. Uh, we invested heavily, me and some other companies invested heavily into machine learning for uh, anime. And that technology started being used in 2018 for anime and visual novels. And that reconstructs, you know, of course, a static image in real time. But today, you know, on PS5 and stuff, uh, it allows, because visual novels are very uh, resource heavy actually on RAM because of the nature of like how it loads in images and assets, sound, voices all at the same time. And the engines are generally horrible uh, because most of them are very much home baked for one specific purpose on PC and then putting down console doesn't really uh, always work out. But today, um, games that I've been producing have machine learning in them and are actually reconstructing images in 4K natively uh, on the fly. And uh, it's kind of interesting because here we're doing it in 3D, but I've been watching this stuff for 2D uh, since the mid 2010s. Yeah, so I actually right. had something to add there, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to add FSR wait, to your visual wait. novels? Yeah. <laughs> Go buy my uh, uh, my girlfriend's a mermaid. No, don't. I think that uh, you like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll I'll consider it. Oh, it's on very, the house very, for you, Rich. I very swiftly. <laughs> I'll consider it very swiftly, then dismiss it. <laughs> Look, Sonic's birthday. What's going on? Well, it is in fact Sonic's anniversary, and it's been celebrated in many ways uh, the last couple of days. I don't know if you've been paying attention, Rich, uh, but uh, you uh, didn't you start in the industry around the same time as Sonic kind of made his uh, emergence? I I predate Sonic by a good uh, Sonic. year and a bit. Yeah. Um, Sonic was uh, 1991, right? So uh, I think we first saw code for that in 1991. Um, and I started in 1990. So, uh, yes. Well, I'll tell you what, my arrival uh, in the games industry kind of was closer to the arrival of the Super Famicom in Japan. And that actually opened, I mean, if we're talking about Sonic memories here, um, it was quite interesting because I think um, when Super Mario World arrived on Super NES, this was a game that literally drew crowds in our office. You know, people who weren't really into gaming were looking at this and saying, wow, this is really pretty awesome. And then, you know, put F-Zero in, it's like, okay, this is, even, this is you know, visually just astonishing. We've never seen anything like it. So fast forward a few months later to when Sonic arrived, and actually, uh, I don't think anybody was in any, any doubt that it was a special platform game. Um, but I do think that people were so sort of taken with what uh, Super Mario World had done that initially when that cartridge arrived, there wasn't quite the same excitement because, again, uh, talking about sort of hype cycles, um, this was supposed to be uh, Sega's counterpoint uh, to Super Mario. But... Again, it wasn't really a like-for-like -like competitor, really. It's a completely different gameplay experience. It's true. Well, Sonic kind of took a lot of what Mario was and turned it on its head, right? With, in terms of attitude and design and even uh, execution in terms of uh, gameplay. the platforming and mm -hmm. the level designs. So I do think that was very successful of kind of pointing out, uh, I would say, weaknesses in Nintendo's mascot, <laughs> but just kind of like... Finding its own um, the lack yeah, of growth, maybe basically yeah, for yeah. some teenagers. I guess uh, part of this maybe it would be good to reminisce a bit on our first contacts with uh, uh, Sonic games. Uh, Rich kind of went over his right now. What about you, Audi? 
Um, I was the first Sonic, and I lived, you know, in Europe, so I had a horrendous uh, meeting with Sonic because it ran at terrible speeds, and uh, I had seen Sonic uh, NTSC on television. I forget if I'd seen it on Games Master or something like this. It was some TV show. It might have been Games World, for that matter. Um, and had seen, heard the music, seen the, the game, and then when we got the cartridge on our Mega Drive, I could e instantly tell that it wasn't as fast as I expected. And lo and behold, many years later, uh, this would become very clear. And I think Rich probably knew this from day one since he had the Japanese console in the offices. So, but um, in terms of my favorite Sonic memory from back in the day, it has to be the reveal of Sonic Adventures on uh, oh, Sonic Dreamcast. Adventure, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Adventure. Just that uh, that was kind of the biggest next gen moment I think I ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, just like seeing that game was like uh, and playing yeah. it. I think that impressed me a lot. Was, that we had demo yeah, kiosks it, up at the local game store before Dreamcast launched. Uh, I think it was yeah. first like Japanese units, and then. But I played a lot of it before release, and I was like so stoked for it. Uh, <laughs> watching things online and the, the stuff like that. But I think like Richard was actually at one of the reveals for it, possibly. For for, for Sonic, um, yeah, I went to the Sega New Challenge conferences in Japan. Uh, I can't recall if it was there. I'm sure it was. Uh, <laughs> because this was like a very long time ago now. Um, but, uh, well, another funny story. We got um, uh, Sonic 2 uh, review code in. And there were, well, let's just say that uh, at the time, Sega was reeling from, uh, they thought that review code was being leaked onto bulletin boards. So to, to actually get code in the house to, to you know, to actually review, um, so Sega weren't particularly keen on it. And then uh, one day we got into the office and uh, the Sonic 2 cartridge was missing. <laughs> and uh, basically the editors were freaking out. You know, they were sort of hunting high and low for it. And uh, we were at the point of uh, calling the police when uh, one of the reviewers came into the office and said, yeah, I borrowed it overnight. <laughs> you want to play more? Because <laughs> he was reviewing it. It was like, okay, this was the, you know, the, the years before mobile phones. You couldn't call him up and see what was going on but yeah that was quite amusing <laughs> <laughs> um, that, was a, that was a sonic 2 it was a worldwide launch one of the very first like same day launch yeah, right. for every country oh that's interesting and amazing they pulled it off back then yeah back then it was especially yeah. difficult due to distribution uh it just was yeah. not what it is today so no yeah absolutely yeah brilliant game though i mean that i think oh, that no. is a, a great example of a sequel that really does ramp up everything and and I think they really hit their stride. They're possibly my favorite Sonic game of all time as well. Up there for me, yeah. I think Cerny yeah, was involved was a, too. Of the 2D. <laughs> Sonic Mania. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mania is uh, basically, you know, possibly the, the best sequel to Sonic 2. It is. <laughs> it's the missing Saturn game. Because that was a, what's so ex uh, special about Adventure 2 was that we had been missing Sonic, proper Sonic, for a whole generation. And then finally, adventure came and seemed to kind of be exa exactly what we wanted. I think has probably has survived as well no. over time. Well, I mean, I think two mm -hmm. is better. Fundamentally, part of the problem with Sonic is that he is pretty fast. I mean, the games aren't just focused on speed, but you know, one of the techniques that made the original so impressive was Yuji Naka was able to scroll the playfield at such a high speed and basically bring in new tiles as you move very quickly, which was cool. Uh, but doing that in a three D world, especially back then when we were first doing 3d you cross a lot of territory in a very short period of time in these sonic 3d games and fundamentally that means you need a huge map which means more memory more resources uh and they just didn't have the ability to stream in large chunks of level data at a high enough speed back then to make it work uh so everything had to be broken up into these little chunks and it just kind of killed the pacing a little bit because you know you just you can't do it <laughs> back then. It took a long time to get there. I almost wonder if Sonic would have uh, benefited from uh, waiting a gen uh, to go 3D or maybe having like uh, untextured, like untextured graphics I find very beautiful actually. Um, but an uh, untextured like Sonic might've been, 
I actually do find Bubsley 3D strangely attractive. Um, <laughs> what, so it, it wouldn't have yeah, it yeah. wouldn't have launched on there, obviously. But one example I can think of is something like if you look at what they did with SSX on PlayStation Two, how they would have these. It was one of the first games to have these tracks where you'd move from the top to the bottom, and it could take like upwards of ten minutes to reach the bottom because the the way they were able to load in the level data, they could create these gigantic stages. And that's exactly what Sonic kind of needed and never really got until much much later. Uh, yeah, you know, they could have done that if you're right, because you would never see behind you that way in, in any of those stages. It's very smart. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do actually have another Sonic memory thinking about it, and it is related to the new challenge conference, because uh, now I recall that we did actually have a sit down roundtable with Yuji Naka. And um, what, uh, the reason I remember it is because uh, there was a, I think it was a French site um, that had leaked screenshots. And he was furious. He was absolutely spitting mad. And he wasn't happy at all about the whole thing. And, Yuji Naka, uh, right? Kind of, yeah. And it kind of permeated into the into the, the sort of, uh, I wouldn't say the, the, the sort of round table that we did, but the kind of background chat surrounding it. So, yeah, that was, <laughs> it's funny how you remember things in a weird way, but that's that one. I interviewed the Yuji Naka when I, when I worked for a magazine back in the day. I interviewed him for a game called Ivy the Kiwi, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Ivy hmm. the Kiwi. Uh, on the Wii. That, yeah. And I had uh, about 45 minutes with him. And I've never heard a man more angry at uh, the general fans and population of the United States and Europe. Uh, but he felt very much like his game had been a forgotten and miscommunicated and proceeded just kind of not be happy for most of the interview and trying to get me to answer for <laughs> all this crying and, sense. Uh, yeah he he's always struck me as someone that uh, is a bit of a complicated man i gather that to say it like that yeah. so, um, but yeah, so it's the 30th anniversary of Sonic, and it's been celebrated in many ways. And uh, of course, one that was a few weeks ago is the Sonic Origins um, collection. I think that's mm -hmm. what uh, it's called. Something like that, which yeah. Which seem? Do you know, John, if that is using white? I think it is. Uh, I think they confirmed that yeah. it is the widescreen versions, okay. and it's all being done properly. So, which could be really cool. Yeah, because for many years those were locked to mobile. And then M2 had the Sega Ages versions on console, which do not have widescreen. Mm -hmm. But this Origins collection seems to be having one and two and three. And CD, in, uh, I think. And CD in HD, but that was released already, though. That's true. Uh, on in consoles, HD. yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, there was also the announcement of a Minecraft oh, DLC, yeah. which uh, allows you to have uh, Green Hill Zone themes and sonic himself in <laughs> minecraft kind of i don't play on minecraft but i know it's very popular and I, I i just kind of looked over the reactions to it and people were very happy so i think there is some sort of overlap i mean it's no roblox oh, yeah. though like if you've seen the sonic games in roblox it's kind of insane i need to do a video <laughs> on this at some point because it's like it's genuinely shocking it's like wait they managed to bring over all the mechanics from sonic unleashed mm -hmm. into roblox and it actually works like yeah, okay. that's cool <laughs> And then, of course, uh, I think to culminate the whole anniversary was the um, Sonic Symphony yeah, that uh, happened a few that days today. ago. It happened, yeah. yeah. I haven't watched it uh, yet. As of this recording, it happened like yesterday. Yeah. And it was a uh, it was the Proc Philharmonic that uh, performed it. Um, and uh, I watched some of it. It was quite spectacular because Sonic is uh, the rhythm of Sonic music. Uh, is very hard. I've produced quite a few <laughs> orchestral game music shows over the years, uh, and it's very difficult to appropriate sonic music to an orchestra. And uh, I was reading some uh, production notes on this, and that they spent uh, actually a few years getting this set uh, set up oh. and uh, arranged. And uh, yeah, it's very impressive. But what was even more impressive was that Dreams Come True uh, was actually part of this and came back to make a new Sonic song during the intermission. The same people that, or the same composer that made Sonic 1. And 2. The music for that. Yeah. And 2. Uh, so, and there's been some, uh, over the years, uh, there's been some differences between well, these parties. It's funny so it's very though, fun to Dream, see them back. Dreams Come True recently did that commercial for o Oi Ocha, Weird. which was. Uh, yep. 
uh green tree it, green tea yeah it was a green hill zone with like vocals which is interesting <laughs> And yeah, uh, Crush 40 showed up, of course, because you can't have a Sonic concert without Crush 40. No. Uh, I was looking at the credits, though, John, and uh, I was curious who was the uh, musical director for this. And the name of the musical director is uh, Nakama Shota. Wait, who really? Actually my old, uh, Shota? Yes, who was actually my old production partner from back in the day. Oh, and I was cool. quite amazed to see him on the credits, but it was him. And uh, I'll put a... Uh, I'll put a uh, embarrassing photograph of him here, right here, uh, so you can see us together. <laughs> so, talking of Sonic uh, composers, uh, Sonic Three. Uh, what's this Michael Jackson story about? Yeah, oh, uh, so the Michael Jackson story is complicated, uh, but can you uh, make, can you make it short? <laughs> can okay. you uncomplicate it? Yeah. So uh, he was definitely uh, contacted to do the soundtrack for Sonic Three. Uh, he worked on some tracks, uh, and he wasn't happy with the sound that was coming out um, <laughs> and uh, so his production team uh, took over and that's why there are similarities to actual mj songs yeah there's actual so, like samples directly from some of the samples, songs yeah. that show up in the game so and you can hear them wow. yeah and that was a story that i helped break uh for the website that i was working for back in the day with his production partner so i'll see if i can find a link to that in uh, archive.org because uh, I don't remember off the top of my head all the details right now. But uh, it was confirmed back then when he was traced down that MJ had involvement. And uh, it wasn't so much about the uh, legal stuff that came afterwards. Uh, that was kind of just uh, as the game neared the completion, that was a uh, easy out. No, I'm, I'm curious though <laughs> why, why that stuff went away though. Like, um, you know, like the PC port, for instance, they stripped out all the tracks that had mj music samples in it and replaced it with very lousy uh weird midi compositions that are not good those at all. compositions though were uh, the original compositions yeah, the, from sega that's interesting but i i guess it's kind of ruined by the fact that it was midi and like they didn't the yes, instrumentation yes, that, midi's awesome but the instrumentation choice is really important it was just a conversion work. someone yeah. just took the table data Oof, and convert to midi no but the instruments are wrong and some of the notations is wrong. Yeah, so the reason why that couldn't show up is um, it had something to do with rights with, uh, I think his name was Barry something, uh, but he was uh, part of MJ's production crew. And there was some, and it still is, some kind of rights issue involved with all this. But they've been trying for years to figure that out. Yeah, and I think now with Origins... They must have probably, solved it. Yeah. Cool. So it'll be interesting to see. So yeah, yeah. Um, Lots of uh, familiar names uh, and Sonic for the anniversary. So it's pretty cool to see. Uh, we all have memories of it, except Alex. I didn't hear any memories of yours. Uh, Sonic for me, I re actually, the first time I remember seeing Sonic was the Game Gear uh, game. Oh, I forget which one that just... was. So Yeah, so I remember seeing that first and I just was really uh, kind of thought, thought the Game Gear was cool. I actually didn't think much of Sonic at the time, even though now if I probably looked at it, I probably would have thought Sonic was a bad idea on the Game Gear just because it was really blurry screen. The uh, game was but, slow. uh, it was but, slower on the the game itself was different, yeah. so it worked okay. Is it? Yeah, it's not the same. Oh, okay, it's cool. an original those game. Games are great. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I like cool. those games. That's by uh, Agent Yuzo Koshiro's company. Exactly. Oh, cool. And he did the music too, and awesome. the sister did the graphics. Yep. Ayano. So, not bad. Good stuff. Well, let's move on to the next item. The docket simply says this, and it says Jonathan Frakes joins PUBG. Really? What? Jonathan <laughs> Frakes, baby. You, everyone knows who Jonathan Frakes is, right? Of yeah, of course. Well, everybody He's loves Jonathan and gargoyles. Frakes. Yeah. Burnt Tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, yes, Burnt Tomatoes. Uh, don't remind me of that show, Alex. <laughs> that was a Picard. That was a Picard reference. So, of course, Jonathan Frakes, a.k.a. William Riker in TNG, one of my favorite shows of all time. I watch it every year. And I think all of us on the docket here are fans, right? I know he, me and Rich, at least. Uh, Rich Alex, is like a, Alex is a gigantic TNG oh, fan. Yeah, yeah perfect. I love TNG. So, <laughs> and apparently he joined PUBG because I, I'm not very familiar with PUBG. Um, my only involvement with it was that I went to a PUBG party in Tokyo 
where the whole team was there. Uh, and they were trying to launch it with a party in Akihabara. And uh, all the Japanese staff or all the Japanese personnel that was there, none of them knew what PUBG was. And they kept coming up to me and asking, what's PUBG? And I was like, I'm just a guest here. I don't know. Well, I bet, I bet they know now. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, yeah. I mean, it took over <laughs> Japan by storm. Uh, but uh, apparently... Uh, they've been trying very hard to differentiate themselves from the other battle royales by including lore and story, which is an interesting concept. And uh, they've been doing a, a, something called the Callisto Protocol, which okay. is kind of like some sort of a universe creating thing for them. Yeah, I've uh, heard about that single player thing, isn't it? Yeah, interesting. It's kind of yeah. like a, it looked like a Dead Space. Kind of game weird okay it yeah has connection to pubg I'm curious uh it's also interestingly i think the lead producer on it is actually the person who was at ea uh at the time and worked on dead space oh i think that's so i forget they, the yeah, name it looked yeah. very there was some clear inspiration there so i was curious what the story was there but it mm -hmm. has some connection to pubg and then pubg itself is getting uh these lore updates and they're being read by Jonathan Frakes. Who, I mean, all right. Who's better? That's He's cool. A great reading voice. Yes. And just a great personality overall. And, you know, seems to be taking a pretty heavy sci fi angle. Cool. So I actually watched it and I was uh, very taken by him. He's like a modern day Fabio, that man. You <laughs> could say anything in the form of him. Uh, Buongiorno. I'm Fabio. And I'm very interested in what makes romance work. <laughs> but uh, he, yeah, it, it just, there's not much to say about this. The only thing I can say is that I watched it and I got like these flashbacks to like uh, Red Alert 2 and 3 with like the FMV sequences. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's the only difference is that Jonathan Frakes already has been in space, so he doesn't need to do that. No, he does not. But uh, yeah, it kind of made me feel like that. and. Yeah, that's all I actually have to say about this. All I've got to say about it is that, you know, I'm a bit sort of frustrated that Frakes is not in game. But then again, but then again, if he was in game, he'd simply win all the time. Yeah. Well, the thing is, Rich, <laughs> is, since this is all lore based, it suddenly makes sense. You remember when we were playing that one time and you were inside the buildings, but there were no buildings on my screen? <laughs> what if, what if it's all part of this mystery? It's it's actually a uh, broken it's lore. Uh, uh, <laughs> Broken hologram. That's what it was. The, uh, true. The, no, the, it's false. All of it is false. It was made up by a writer, uh, <laughs> John, John Linneman. No, it did happen, and uh, it did happen. I would, I would love to see an in-law explanation for how bad the Xbox One version was at launch. <laughs> <laughs> that would be epic. You know, the stories, stories of entire cities disappearing for certain people, but not other people. <laughs> If you spend that like three hundred dollars awesome. on cameo, I'm sure Jonathan Frakes can tell just you <laughs> what happened. Wait, are you saying he's on cameo? He's on cameo, of course he is. What? Everyone. The only person not on cameo is you. <laughs> Clamoring to that OnlyFans dream of yours, and you have one subscriber. It's wow, <sighs> that's that's just phenomenal. I don't know where Wait, the, the possibilities are endless. It's time to make a new uh, DF introduction. It's a new DF uh, member. We'll just pay Jonathan Frakes like every t first day to join this panel. <laughs> I'm sorry, my, 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 mind is, my mind is alive with the possibilities here. You know. <laughs> Perhaps Jonathan could record uh, one of our face-off voiceovers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> True. You know, where we really need to hammer home a point. Who better? And now for the face-off, he can say something like that. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I just well, don't know what to say about that, except uh, good. <laughs> uh, interesting one here. We're talking about Mist coming to uh, virtual reality oh, yeah. in Q3. What's that all about? Uh, well, actually, so I believe it was originally an Oculus Quest 2 thing, and now they're bringing it to PC and Mac. Uh, and this is essentially so the original Mist has been remade many times in many different ways, and this is sort of the latest take on that with the highest quality visual presentation, but. Uh, for me, it's probably the most appealing idea, just conceptually, because Mist is a game. It's all about puzzle solving, being on this in these isolated on the isolated island as well as inside the books. Uh, but you know, it kind of revolutionized what you could 
I guess this genre a little bit back in the day, even if it seems pretty quaint by today's standards. But the idea of actually going into that space in virtual reality is actually appealing because VR has a way to really sort of bring atmosphere much closer to you in a way that you can't get from a normal monitor. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you guys have experienced this stuff, I'm sure, uh, and just what VR brings to the table. And I feel like Myst itself being a non-action game, it focused on atmosphere and puzzle solving, uh, it just feels like this could be a really fun, interesting thing to just hang out in. And I don't have an Oculus Quest 2, so I haven't actually been able to try it there, but... Uh, I am actually really interested to give this a shot. My only complaint, it's not even a complaint, really. They've done amazing work with the visual design from what I can see, but I've always wanted them to go back and use modern technology to perfectly replicate the original CGI renders because we can do that in real time now. Like, it would actually look dated now, but I'd love to see it. Like, all the original renders, exactly the way they were presented in the first place, but done in real time, I think would be I would like that too. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was what I was about to say is that like this seems like a perfect fit for VR in that sense because it's all atmosphere and it's all it kind of yeah. hands on, you know, figuring out these what, uh, pretty obtuse. What puzzles, I don't know but... is that I haven't played it. Dottie, do you know uh, if um if it uses like motion or like, you know, hand control? Because I feel like I have no that idea. would add yeah, a lot to it as well. VR. Because, you know, originally yeah. you're just clicking on things with the mouse. But if you actually, you know, you get to use like the Oculus Touch or something to interact with the objects in the world, that becomes even more interesting. I would think that that's what they kind of have to do I would in order think so. for this to be more interesting or else it's just kind of... You know, it, the same it almost has to be again, right just you seeing it because otherwise you'd be, yeah no it has to be it wouldn't work otherwise i think so mm. no so yeah i always uh, when i see this kind of stuff i kind of want it in the original cg renders and then being able to walk around when it comes to something like that i wanted a reboot vr game like the original reboot cartoon series renders oh, and reboot. being able to walk around the city you know yeah. from the same era someone needs to make this so somehow <laughs> when it comes to vr i kind of want regression rather than <laughs> modernization so i don't know why okay well let's move on to the next one then uh what's this the intellivision amico right what's going on here because the <laughs> the notes here read simply a disaster of epic proportions okay so rich <laughs> what do you know about the intellivision amico um I think as much as I need to know, which is nothing. Okay. <laughs> yes. Good answer. So, uh, and this is kind of funny. We won't, we won't be spending too much time on this uh, simply because there's not much to say. Uh, but uh, last week when we did our E3 roundup, we had a very short segment where we talked about the Amico because it had a presentation at E3 where they seemingly updated people on the status and the latest game builds and uh, all this kind of nifty stuff. And John and I watched it and we don't have, we haven't been paying attention to the Amico stuff much. It's not really in our ballpark. Uh, and for Digital Foundry, it's not even really that relevant because it's not something that's going to push tech very far. Uh, so it's just kind of, it's not something we generally look at. Uh, however, uh, as we did that segment, uh, let's just say we got some colorful messages from a certain fan base telling us that uh, we should do more research, we should look more into it because it will actually impress us. Uh, so we listened to the Amico fans, we did the research, and we were baffled, horrified, and puzzled by everything we found. Uh, so uh, thank you, Amico fans, for telling us to check it out. But the... Uh, one of the biggest shockers for me as um, I actually did something which uh, will make you all question my sanity, but I watched every single Amico video I could find officially from Amico on YouTube to see through the beginning till now what had been actually shown off and what were the updates that were at E3. Uh, because, of course, as it happened at E3, uh, we hadn't had like the foresight of sitting down watching every single presentation for the Amico. Uh, but I looked around and I found uh, about 90% of what was shown in the video at E3 to be old footage uh, as of like August of last year. So there was a couple of snippets of new games. Uh, there was a soccer game and a shooter, I believe, that we saw that seemed new, but we can't verify. Uh, but the rest of it was actually footage of games um, performing quite poorly, mind you, oh, yeah, from very last poorly. year quite poorly 
which seems to suggest that um yeah this won't be pushing any well <laughs> I, beyond chance. that i wanted to i got I actually get press emails from them now which is interesting and they sent out one yesterday saying hey we have a brand new trailer from e3 2021 you know featuring new gameplay footage but it turned out to be it is the tw sorry it's the 2019 trailer from gamescom repackaged tommy's tommy tallarico is in there they they changed the color grading on him so he's like less orange now uh they changed the lower thirds they added a couple new clips they changed they swapped out the cg renders of the miko itself and now it's white instead of gold but it's otherwise like you can put it split screen and we should probably even do it right here but as you you know it's the same video and I was baffled, like, why would they put out in an email saying, here's this brand new video, and it's actually the same video from two years ago, uh, which is similar to what they did with E3, where they just used a bunch of old stuff as well. And on top of that, you know, in that email, they not, you know, it's hard to get a YouTube channel started, but they linked to a YouTube channel in there that has, like, big coverage for it. That it's Basically, it's a, a channel that has, like, 500-something subscribers. Hmm. And it's just odd to it's see this. Called the Amico kid, right? Uh, he's in there as well. Yeah. Um, which, whatever. It's fine. It's so there's that, and there's just swag and stuff. There were a number of things that were raised to us in the comments section regarding our uh, E3 roundup. Uh, one was um, the fact that uh, they uh, there was someone that pointed out very clearly to me that uh, Amico, Intellivision Amico as a company, has not started the marketing yet. They're not spending money on marketing. Therefore, it is unfair of us to bring it up in, you know, with the other conferences because they spent money on their presentations and blah, blah, blah. Amico hasn't gotten there yet. Uh, this is false in the sense that we are getting press emails, which clearly states that, you know, this is being marketed. Whether or not they have money for it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the press is getting updates and they're supposed to, Wait, to follow up on and if they're this. not spending money who filmed and edited those videos well uh let's uh let's just say that uh, <laughs> whoever did that should probably practice a little bit more and i edit this show uh but like the the whole marketing thing not being started is false you know it's at e3 uh, and they clearly have spent money and it, it's not even about being unfair because what all they needed to do was get a capture card, play the games that they have in an updated fashion if, because it's been over a year. That takes less than an hour. That's just an Elgato kit or it's an Aver Media or you know, if it runs on composite, get a RetroTink. I don't know what it runs on. I'm guessing HDMI. Uh, but um, yeah, and then they also pointed out that, oh, there was tons of developers for it and we hadn't even looked into the games coming out. And I tried to, I actually contacted uh, a few developers I knew had some kind of connection to the Amico to speak uh, confidentially and not that something nothing salacious came out of that but just kind of it was clear from one thing that there's very little communication from Amico to the developers at the moment and second of all a lot of this uh, when you say developer it makes it sound like you know just big studios are involved and whatnot but what's clear is that there's a lot of enthusiasts uh, developing for Demica, one man operations and such. This is all fine, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't bring a lot of confidence to a console that is four months out because this is actually releasing in October. So they say. In the, <laughs> yes, uh, we'll see. Uh, I have my suspicions that in August we'll see a uh, delay again because I don't know if they've been able to source all the parts. And that could be because of the pandemic. So that's not to say that they're unprofessional or anything. Though they should probably be more transparent where their production line is at, because uh, the people we talked to uh, did not could not even answer this. So it's kind of everything is up in the air regarding this. And um, yeah, we we could. The thing is, we tried to find answers uh, from you know, and we don't have any investment in this, so we don't care whether or not it's positive or negative. We just because the fans of the Amico came to us and said, hey. Ratface, go find more info because he didn't look. I went and looked, and uh, we found more questions that yeah. raised more concerns than we did find answers. I think fundamentally, we'd like to see this succeed. I I like the idea of it. It's just that what they're showing, 
um, it's questionable. Okay, fair enough. Um, just one question that I've got uh, arising from all of this is Ratface, your official hacker alias. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, that, that was a, someone greeted me like that. I didn't know that my middle name was actually uh, publicly known. But, uh, <laughs> it's out there. Very nice to meet you too. But uh, yeah, uh, we actually got, um, this is also a bit concerning because a lot of the messages we got regarding the Miko was quite aggressive. And this is something that I think the Amica Corporation should kind of be aware of is the fact that uh, it's okay to be passionate and it's okay to cultivate the passion of the group. But the moment a journalistic outlet like us comes and looks at it because they send us press materials and we don't have any answers to draw from that press material, then it's not regard it's not up to us that we have to go and confidentially get people to talk and all this stuff. We should be able to at least see where in the you know production line this is at. Can we expect the console in October? This is a big question. Um, and uh, but we should be clear about one thing though, John. What's that? The price is not two ninety nine. It is two forty nine. So uh, okay. wait, 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 are you sh okay? Well. The thing is, though, is I just clicked on within the link of that email they sent out. They have links to pre-order the console, and they all say on sites like GameStop that it retails for two hundred ninety-nine. Oh, so you're actually correct then, because we got a lot of messages saying. Oh wait, wait, okay, I I price. see what's going on. Some so there's a, the Galaxy Purple is two ninety-nine, and the Graphite Black and Glacier White are two forty-nine. I see. So they up they upsell the galaxy purple color uh for fifty dollars more so that's where the confusion stems from we also need to note that in that presentation which um you know reuses a lot of footage but the new footage most of the people made use of cell phones and most of the footage that was shown using the amico controller uh was kind of hidden and obscured and I was looking at stuff from when was in August of last year, and it was something earlier this year. And there seems to be kind of like one prototype controller that everyone has in in the Amica Corporation, uh, but it has a ton of lag, a ton of lag. And I looked at the presentation again, where they keep saying that the firmware hasn't been updated, therefore uh, the system is not running uh, proper. This could be true, and I mean in development. Uh, that's something that happens. But as we're now four months out, it is pretty concerning to put out an E3 video where um, you have Photoshop stock images, which you know was brought up on Twitter. And it's not that using stock images in itself is an issue. This Everyone does that. But it's the fact that it's four months out and you should be having prototype units and the ability to shoot that. Uh, that doesn't take a lot time and resources either that's just setting up a camera on the tripod and it holding the controller some people do it uh, but there's not enough footage of it actually being put into actual use with the console in the video the only uh the only photos i saw of it being used was they, there was some interview on ign middle east specifically with tommy on this and they did seem to have some photographs of the controller working so that's like the closest thing i could find it's kind of we were talking about uh the wii u we did a wii u conference for patreon uh recently where we talked about communication of your console and man the communication around this thing is just so confusing and weird and even we're talking about the competition thing which we also got uh, pretty heavy messages about the fact that we should not compare this to for example the evercade versus but the Evercade versus is a, a clear comparison. It also it receives new games as well as old, both. From like uh, Mega Cat Studios, and Bitma Bureau, like these kinds of people. Uh, it is set up. It's a cheap device set up for family use, uh, and not, you know there's the Intellivision uh, flashbacks, the At Games devices. There's a ton of these devices out there that retail for not one ninety nine, ninety nine. We'll have to talk about this more in the future, but I think fundamentally, if it's like you're looking at this versus the same cost for a Nintendo Switch, I just don't, I can't see why this would ever win out over that. Be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the concern for us as we wrap this up, it's just kind of at four months out, um, this doesn't seem feasible. I mean, 
Uh, it doesn't seem like the uh, we haven't seen any proof that the consoles are be, have been manufactured, have been tested, are ready to be sent out. So I'm guessing we're going to see a situation where maybe pre-orders get sent out, but no retail units. Uh, that could be, or just gets a delay into 2022, of course. Uh, that's possible as well. Uh, but th they really should be a little bit more transparent with the press as they move so close to the actual release of October. I think it's October 8th it's supposed to come out. And uh, we don't know much. Uh, originally, they announced about 60 games that launch, I think, and now it's about 25. So, I mean, things have changed, clearly. Uh, there's names involved from the beginning that now are no longer mentioned uh, in terms of the staff. So a lot of things that um, seems to be kind of uh, not working out the way they wanted to. And this, again, this can happen in the development phase. So it's not to say that this is unacceptable. It's just the transparency of it is concerning. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's move on. Final sort of news point that we've got for this week is uh, the Alex Kidd remake. And uh, yeah. there seems to be problems with the fact that uh, there seems to be shades of the PAL nightmare, the PAL 50 hertz nightmare. What's going on here? Because I can't believe okay, this. Okay, so... There's um, the ghost of PAL. I actually, yeah. I, I got review code for this, and I was thinking, okay, I'll do a Sonic Mania-style video on this because I love these sorts of games. And it, it looks... Visually, it looks awesome. Makes a good first impression. Uh, but I noticed right away, I started moving around, and the scrolling and the general movement of the character is very choppy, shall we say? It looks wrong. Uh, so I immediately captured footage of it and went through it frame by frame and discovered that out of six frames, only five frames will be new frames. So every five, so five out of six frames are displayed at that exact interval. But some things like animation frames can update in that sixth frame slot. So it's still outputting at 60 hertz, but all scrolling and character movement is 50. So I was like, what the heck is going on here? This is, this is too much of a coincidence for my taste so i actually reached out to the developer about it um who was very very nice and it's a very small team like all of the art in this game was done by one guy which is really cool um but uh it turns out after investigating for some answers that yeah the game itself like the physics and, and the way the game works is all updated at 50 frames per second uh i don't have confirmation on why it's this way but my best guess is that because this is a European studio and the game allows you to switch back and forth between the new graphics and the 8-bit Sega Master System graphics, that they probably started from the European PAL ROM or from the PAL version as like a base. Again, I don't know if that's actually the case, but that's the only thing that makes sense to me uh, because it almost feels like everything in the game is now tied to this original version that's included that you can swap to. And as a result, the game basically updates at 50 frames per second. And doing a 50 to 60 conversion in that way, that's exactly the issue I complained about with uh, the PlayStation Classic or whatever it was called. Um, it was It's a problem that, that uh, European fans faced with Nintendo's early virtual console releases on the Wii, where like stuff like Super Metroid was released and it was 50 hertz and nobody wanted those versions. Uh, and it's it's just unfortunate to see here because it looks so good and it just doesn't look smooth in motion because the scrolling is just ruined by this 50 frames per second update. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of my big issue with it. Yeah, so I got the game yesterday and we hadn't really talked about this uh, too much. Uh, you had told me that there was some sort of like uh, base in PAL issue, but I hadn't looked at it much because we've been busy with other projects. So I got the game and I forgot about it. Uh, so I put it in my Switch yesterday and started playing. And uh, while I think that the art is neat, uh, it's very noisy. And what I mean by that is that there's too much visually going on uh, contra the classic style. And uh, for example, you have a lot of foreground elements oh, yeah. that block uh, Alex Kidd. So you kind of walk through the terrain and there will be like a rock or something in front of him so you can't see what's happening. And uh, it's kind of like a classic case of uh, over-visualizing your game because uh, it's kind of easy to do that these days with uh, unlimited resources. Uh, my biggest issue though with the game and much, so, much more so than the 50 hertz problem though, that uh, does drive me insane. 
uh, is the hit detection in the yeah, game the because there is a difference between the new graphics and the old graphics in terms of the hitboxes, and I'm not sure what's going on here. I mean, to me, it almost looks uh, like uh, they're using the original Collision, but it doesn't. The new art doesn't perfectly map to it in a way. So it, yes, it feels so like you should be able to adapt it. It's like when you hit one block, it looks like your character sprite could be able to run under yep. it, but you can't because in the original it's yes. designed so you because cannot. There, yeah, there is some kind of disconnect in proportions between uh, the new style and the old. So uh, no, it doesn't really work. And uh, uh, the swimming stuff, it especially uh, graded me pretty hard because it's just, uh, first of all, I don't like swimming stages. Uh, but second of all, the the mismatch in hitboxes between the old version and new uh, in the swimming stages or the swimming segments was so bad that I actually turned the game off. It was so I, bad it, that Alex turned into a chair. I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> yes. that's what happens. So, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Just a quick thing on that. Um, I'm a little bummed out by it, but yeah. yeah should have been the return of alex kid you know there's clearly a lot of talent behind the, the game like the guys that did it especially you know the artwork again it's it's really good looking uh but the game needs more time and polish and i wish they had <laughs> I, I wish they had come to someone like like us early on not that they necessarily need that i'm just saying like i could look at this and within like two seconds it's immediate that there's something going on here uh, and you know it's a shame that it ended up this way yeah um it feels like to me uh, a game that um kind of plateaued at some point in development and from that point uh, they could only fix so much and then go to release like a budgetary issue maybe uh but it definitely feels like that two three more months of polish and then some more bug testing or a qa in general would have done wonders to this game and uh maybe a patch could help um i certainly hope the best for the team i wish that the game impressed me a little bit more out of the gate i feel kind of bad that we have to uh, showcase it this way but uh in the uh, name of being fair here we have to kind of point out that uh there are problems with the alex kid remake yeah i think so i think you know just in summary from my perspective the the 50 hertz issue with power games uh continues to cause issues in the present day. And I think uh, probably the worst example was the PlayStation 2 classics on PlayStation 4, where the, you know they just ran 50 hertz games at, on a 60 hertz console. And it's, it's really not good. And uh, if there is NTSC code available, uh, if there was a US release, uh, it should be used. Uh, the only, the, yeah, the only issue I can possibly see is uh, titles that were developed specifically with power territories in mind. Which this one was not. Um, I mean, this this which yeah. this, this was a Japanese years. game, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on. Okay, so let's quickly talk about some DF content here. Um, DLSS two point two Lego Builders, Alex. Hey, uh, um, <clears throat> Lego Builders is a Unity HDRP game. And it's the first time I think we've really seen um, the latest HDRP features uh, actually put to the test in a game. Um, my video that I'm making on this right now is not going to actually really focus too much on uh, like the intense, uh, usual digital foundry um, investigation into uh, the performance and all these other things and exactly what each effect is doing. It's just kind of more of a highlight of the Lego Builders game because I find it very attractive. And I think I just want to point out that this is the first time we've seen a Lego game uh, that, you know, goes into that photorealistic angle in a way that is uh, just very compelling. And I think the game's really well, well made. Um, as part of that though, it is using DLSS 2.2, I believe. And um, uh, there's been a lot of talk on the internet about, you can take the DLL, as it's called, the uh, from DLSS 2.2, from a 2.2 game, and inject it or kind of replace the DLL in older games that used at least DLSS 2.0. And uh, yeah, it produces different results and images, and most likely by the time uh, this Direct is out for the general public, my video may be on the channel, we'll take a look here. Um, but basically, initial contact so far after uh, some more than surface level testing is that DLSS 2.2 is uh, better than earlier iterations at 
uh, lower resolution internal target rendering. So like something like the ultra performance mode or performance mode does actually looks better. Now it, it will produce more detail and uh, more completed anti-alias lines uh, than it used to in the past with this 2.2 DLLL, as well as the fact that now um, most of the uh, frame reprojection issues, like where you could see ghosts from previous frames sometimes in DLSS 2.1 and earlier, most of that is gone now. Um, I still have yet to do the check to see how it affects uh, moving foliage. I've tested um, a variety of different scenarios, but if it also uh, eliminates the issue with moving foliage, then we're looking at a pretty significant difference here. Um, but you know, if you look at a game like uh, Cyberpunk or Death Stranding, or even the latest Metro Exodus, uh, which did not ship with 2.2, there are some very nice differences there that are really awesome to see. Um, so it's just uh, an iteration of the technique and it's gotten better. And that's really there's all there is to say about that content right now. So I've got a couple of questions about that. First of all, um, ultra performance is better. So do you think that, the, I mean, it's all kind of gone quiet on this front, but remember that RTX 3090 was the 8K gaming card and uh, your analysis of the 8K ultra performance wasn't hugely favorable. Um, what do you think? Do you think it would help there? I think it will not help, can it? It will definitely help. It um, cannot help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just got worse. Um, no, I, uh, I think it will definitely help that out there. It did, maybe that's something else to look at, but recording 8K is such a massive pain that, uh, like, like last time I tried it, it, it barely worked. It barely worked. Um, it's awful. Um, so, I don't know if I'll end up testing that, but it'll make it more compelling for sure. I think it was still like a really big bridge too far back then, like where it was just like not at all the same. Um, it looked better than 4K, but that was about it. Uh, so it'll just be a better version of that. I still think 8K, like I still think in general, this eight times upscale, like where you could literally put that internal resolution image eight times into the final upscaled image. I still think that probably needs uh, probably needs more info. I don't think that's a very realistic target for most uh, use cases, for most users. Well, it might be a time for me to, because I've got an 8K screen. I might check it out. Um, the second question I had is, um, uh, without giving too much away, I do suspect that uh, DLSS Ultra Performance or work derived from it will have some bearing on the Nintendo Switch successor at some point. Um, so, you know, assuming, let's say, um, I mean, it is at its heart going to be a mobile GPU. So let's assume that we're talking about a 720p base image, which is upscaled to 4K for a, a consumer level 4K TV screen in living room conditions. Does this work help there in improving quality? Yeah, it does. Um, it was noticeable on my screen uh, immediately after just inserting the DLL, DLL into the game because, um, Maybe not necessarily, like it does improve the way the image resolves in terms of detail and things like that. But I thought the biggest difference was there was less like horizontal hatching or hitching or like sawtooths that the 720p mode always tended to have. There was less of that. Um, so I think that was like the biggest macro effect overall. And I thought it looked more uh, just just better. It was a pleasing image. I, didn't, I wouldn't consider it necessarily very 4K-like always. Um, but it was a ple more pleasing image in the past. And I think it is, if you played um, like any sort of, you know, like 1440p content uh, on a 4K screen and found it approachable, then this, this is really good. Then this is fine. Okay, good. Well, let's move on. Um, oh, wow, it's me. <laughs> uh, Modern Warfare, 120 hertz on PlayStation 5. Uh, video should be out uh, now, if not... Uh, very, very soon. Uh, but essentially, um, a bit of a, an issue we've had in sort of communicating to the audience is the fact that there can be games that appear on Series X and PlayStation 5 um, where there are big differences. And people seem to get a bit confused between the concept that it's the hardware that's the issue or that it's actually that we've got two very different back compat implementations here. So Warzone is interesting on two fronts. First of all, it's the first 
PS4 game running on PS5 that supports 120 hertz. Um, and secondly, there's this whole concept of games that seem to do well with back compat on one system versus another. And, you know, we still don't have a huge amount of details on how back compat actually works on PlayStation 5. But I have actually now seen the developer documentation. I can share some stuff. Um, PlayStation games on the latest SDK can query the hardware. They can find out very, very easily with one system call if they're running on which system. But uh, according to that same documentation, there are hard set limits on PlayStation 4 Pro that you can't overcome on PlayStation 5, specifically memory. So when a game has a lower resolution on PlayStation 5 via backwards compatibility, it's likely not a system limitation of PlayStation 5. It's a system limitation of PlayStation 4 in that it just hasn't really got the memory to cope with any higher resolution buffers. That's the most likely scenario. Whereas on Xbox Series X, um, it can tap into the Xbox One X co-path where they had uh, nine gigs of RAM available versus like 5.5 on the Pro, which is a big, big difference. So it's kind of like what, you know, what we're trying to sort of put across here is this, you know, um, it's the back compact implementations that can be different, not really the hardware. Um, but the 120 hertz thing is new. It suggests that something is changing on the Sony front because no PlayStation 4 games, as far as I'm aware, will have 120 hertz output. But it does seem to work on Warzone, but only with, H but only with HDR off for some reason. So, you know, I do think this is... Yeah, I mean, it does seem to me that this is all kind of like um, hot fixes and patches because, you know, with Warzone, the future is a native app. Activision has announced this. And it's going to be the same for everything else. It's just we're in this bizarre cross-phase, uh, cross-gen phase at the moment. So it's kind of, you know, watch the video on that. Um, there is some 120 hertz uh, footage on for the supporter program. Um, we had to run it at 60 on YouTube. But, you know, maybe YouTube will up upgrade at some point to support that. Um, but, yeah, let's move on to the next content point. So, John, CRTs, they're back. Yeah, so um, just on, on a whim, we decided it would be fun to do. I'm, I'm basically working on a video revisiting the FW900 CRT, but this time with the new consoles, PS5 and Xbox Series X specifically. And it's more to, you know, I think since we did that video a couple of years back, there's been lots of questions about things and, you know, also, some people don't fully understand, like, okay, wait, what's the benefit here? Like, why would you use this over this? Like, like, what are you guys even talking about? And I, I want to try to make something to look a little bit closer at some of the differences, I guess you could say, and showcase why the technology is interesting. But also noting, I'm not saying people go out and, like, replace their their big TVs with this or anything like that. It's not about that. It's just an interesting thing to look at what this ty type of technology can still bring to the table. Uh, and why it's it's worth looking back to understand that. And, and I would like to see some of this stuff applied to the future. Uh, and I can also do things like now I've seen uh, the black frame insertion on the LG OLEDs as of the CX and up, which uh, matches CRT in terms of motion clarity now, which is the first time I've ever seen that. There's like zero blur, but it has its own drawbacks as well there, which I want to discuss. Uh, but in general, I was just kind of shocked just when you see something like Ratchet and Clank running on this thing, uh, it looks so unbelievably like just due to the nature of a phosphor screen, uh, without a fixed pixel grid, it has this look that it doesn't look like a, like a digital pixelized image anymore. You know what I mean? It just has this like almost analog look that almost looks like it was filmed with a camera rather than like, you know, just a digital thing. Uh, which is really cool to see, and it looks really good, these games like this. So it's it's cool, and I haven't figured out exactly what the video is going to be yet. Like, I'm still in the writing phase, but uh, there should be lots of cool film footage for people to enjoy. So, yeah, I'll be doing that soon. And uh, let's quickly uh, round up with a couple of uh, content announcements. Uh, John, I think you're best placed to talk about these. So um, I guess to begin with, it's all about how we're going to deploy the next episode of DF Retro publicly. It's already available to our supporters on the Retro tier. 
Uh, the issue being that your video was two hours and 45 minutes long. So that's not particularly YouTube friendly. So what's the deal? Uh, yeah, Audie and I went a bit overboard with that one and we made uh, pretty much the most epic and over the top DF retro video I think we've ever done where we covered and will ever do we'll see we may t we may go <laughs> <laughs> never say never but we we thought hey let's cover the playstation launch in every territory and every game for it and do it all in in as much detail as we can and you know contextualize the history around it, it sounded fun and it was uh but yeah it almost ended up being three hours long just about so what we've decided to do for the public release is i actually broke it up into three chunks based on the region and i added in some new uh endings if you will sort of like teasing like this is what's coming on the next episode and all that to try to make it work as a continuous or as three separate pieces so i think what we're going to do is start rolling that out you know start with one part one uh the first week on a sunday and that one's about 50 minutes long and then part two is like an hour and 10 minutes and then part three is also like 50 minutes something like that and kind of put them out one week and then the next week and then the next week so that means like three sundays of df retro episodes for for the public and obviously then uh i think not this week but the week after we should have the next df retro episode out uh, which is less ambitious for sure, for but it's for supporters. It's yeah. for the supporters. For, supporters, for the supporters. Yeah, yeah. and that one will be yeah, interesting that's... too. We'll we'll talk about that soon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is pretty awesome. I mean, three huge parts there, and I think uh, I think what's gratifying for me is that it's a pretty decent example of how what we've been able to do with the supporter program is actually enabling more content on the main channel. Yeah. I, I can just say without that supporter program and the shift away to allow me to do more DF retro, we could not have made this video uh, with the old way that we were working last year and before it, it, just, it wouldn't have been possible to do it. And maybe it's a bit over the, over the top, but it was really something that I enjoyed doing a lot. So I'm really thankful that it is now possible to make such a crazy thing. Uh, and yeah, it was fun. It was kind of like a proof of concept for the support program, right? It was kind of like, well, how far can we take it, you know? And then, you know, maybe it sets the bar a little bit high for a little bit. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, we, we're working on the next episode. It's much smaller, but at the same time, uh, the way we're working on these episodes now and the way we're working together, uh, it's still amazing to see just how well this has worked out. And I don't think people will be let down by the next one either, because uh, uh, yeah, the script is awesome and we're really working hard on it. It's also related to another uh, DF Retro we've done in the past together. Uh, it ties into it, so it should be pretty fun. Interesting. And uh, yeah, let's just round off here with, uh, <laughs> it's kind of tangentially related to DF Retro because um, we had a lot of requests to do Final Fantasy. We, we talked about it on this show, right? Right, yeah. yeah. It's like, well, you know, we don't know anything about the game. Who does? And uh, basically, you know, <laughs> uh, Mark Donaldson from My Life in Gaming knows the game inside out, is an exceptional video producer. We asked him to take a look at the game on PlayStation 5, and what we actually ended up getting back was a 45-minute chronicle of 11 years of, of Final Fantasy XIV with astonishing production values, uh, which raises, you know, but also has in-depth technical appraisal that's well up there with everything that we do, if not better in some respects. So, yeah, this, this has kind of turned into a massive win, and... Um, uh, the content's probably out publicly by the time we talk about it, but my God, this is this is incredible stuff. <laughs> yeah, it goes through every version of FF14, uh, you know, on every console. And uh, John and I also do show up as cameos right. throughout the episode. Also worth noting, and, uh, uh, I want to say thanks to Danny O'Dwyer for helping with the original... 2010 release footage since he did that really awesome documentary over on no clip uh for that game uh we were like where the heck can we get footage for that and he actually still had some so that was great it was a big help so yeah there was early access to that on the supporter program i think it's probably likely to be live for everybody 
right now. So do check it out if you haven't already. But let's move on quickly because we're over time here and uh, talk some Q&A from supporters. Okay, um, let's try and handle these quite quickly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Emmanuel Orlando asks the question, mainly for John, uh, were you able to solve the Dolby Atmos delay? So could you quickly tell us what the delay is and have you solved it? This is a problem when using the Xbox Series consoles and Xbox One X as well, I believe. Essentially, um, I was using Dolby Atmos with the, with the One X by feeding it into my Denon AV receiver and it worked great. Problem is, when I get the Xbox Series X, it's HDMI 2.1 compliant. I want to use those features in the CX. I can no longer run it directly into the receiver without sacrificing those. So I'm essentially waiting on one of the new AV receivers with proper 2.1 implementation. Uh, so for now, I have to rely on uh, ARC. That's HDMI ARC, the audio return channel or whatever, which sort of takes the, the, the audio from, it goes into the TV and then the TV can send back out through the, the another HDMI cable to your AV receiver, the audio signal, right? If you set it to Dolby Atmos, uh, you get horrific latency. Essentially, like if you watch a film, uh, the mouth movement goes completely out of sync. If you play a game, everything is out of sync. You know, you'll fire a weapon, you'll see the animation and stops, and then you hear the gun gunfire. So it's very, very slow. Uh, and this is a problem. I don't know how all TVs handle this, but for sure on the LG CX, it's like this. So it's really, it's unusable. So I can't use it. The solution I found to just getting the audio to be okay was just going back down to bit streamed Dolby Digital 5.1. So the most basic surround option. That was the only way I was able to get audio without latency, but it also means I can't use my Atmos setup, which is unfortunate. Uh, so to answer his question, I haven't found a solution. There is no solution. Like I tried to buy something called the Then Audio Shark eARC processor, which some people have had luck with, but it completely like it caused so many issues with my CX where it would essentially disable the HDMI parts, and I have to factory reset it to fix it. And I'm not the only one that has had that. It it's really weird. So I'm actually selling that <laughs> because of that. Uh, because I don't. I that didn't help. The only solution that I see is the new HDMI 2.1 receivers, which we talked about recently on here. Uh, I essentially have to wait for one of those to become publicly available and that I will purchase one. And that's, that is my solution to this problem is just, just wait until we get the new AV receivers with HDMI 2.1 compatibility. So yeah, there's no good solution. <laughs> okay. Next question. Uh, hi there, DF gang. This is from Agsma, A-G-S-M-A. Uh, this might have been answered already, but here we go. How long will we have to wait until Vulcan becomes the new standard API? Already seeing big titles like Doom Eternal and Hades taking full advantage of Vulcan, which makes me wonder if OpenGL will event eventually drop off. And if it happens, is the transition going to be smooth from a developer and consumer standpoint? Uh, Alex, I'll ask you this question, but I think there's a sort of notable omission of DX12 here. Whoa, whoa, Rich. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. I think there's a notable omission of Mantle. Yeah. <laughs> Come on now. Mantle <laughs> is Vulcan. Ma it's Mantle really needs to... Logan, yeah. we, we need original Mantle. Prize from the dead. Uh, um, I, I mean, I don't think uh, Vulcan will be the premier API, even if I may want it to be in, on like a philosophical level, just because... Uh, Windows is, uh, you know, like the premier development environment. If you work on DirectX, you get a easy porting process to Xbox consoles. Uh, if you have a Vulkan backend only, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the other places where Vulkan is primarily used in Switch uh, and Linux are less relevant gaming use cases and don't have the same level of uptake. Um, uh, Proton on Linux now or DXVK are making um, native Vulkan ports less important to the point where uh, Proton now supports even Vulkan DLSS on Linux and things like that. Um, so Vulkan, I think, is so great and so wonderful, but I don't think it'll ever become the premier, premier API, um, especially for those developers that like you're mentioning that still use OpenGL, which is just a huge surprise that people still use OpenGL. 
Um, that's mainly because there's a like a huge setup cost to get Vulkan running that OpenGL does not have. And so if you're a lower tier developer, you probably never have any of the time to do that anyway, if you're making your own, rolling your own engine. So I think um, Vulkan will increase in size, but never uh, take over. And if it does increase its market share, in the indie space, that's because larger engines will have adopted it as one of the viable backends like Unity or Unreal. That's about it. OK, fair enough. Um, I guess we should move on to the next question. This is from Andrew M. And again, Alex, I think this one is good for you. Uh, do you think the inclusion of ray traced reflections in multiplayer games could potentially offer some players an unfair advantage with the ability to see reflections of off-screen approach off screen opponents? Well, the answer is kind of yes, surely, by definition. Yeah, every game with graphical settings, though, has this problem. Uh, so, like, for example, you can see the shadow of a character, like, ab above and behind you in a game where you have, like, a higher shadow cascade distance set on your altar settings. What about, like, foliage, uh, where you could crank down the foliage draw distance and, mm -hmm. like, get a clear view a of the Tons of terrain. games have the ability to do that, too. So this is just another, uh, this is a, a versioning issue that happens in all games. Um, it's just more stark because you can imagine it probably more in your head that a reflection is visible. At the same time, honestly, how many games have a scenario where that is the thing, the deciding factor for winning? I don't know. Probably seems a little bit low. Yeah. Um, and I guess we'll move on to the final question from Edwin Crump. Where seems to have two very different questions here. Let's tackle the first one. I'm noticing that Digital Foundry is being mentioned more and more in developer interviews, podcasts, blogs, etc. Do you have any idea how DF is viewed within studios and the effect your video and articles have either preemptively or after a video is released? John? Oh, this is an interesting question. And um, so, I mean, I can only talk to our interaction. I think we all talk to a lot of developers often. And by and large, um, their words are usually very encouraging. They've had a lot of nice things to say about us, and I'm very grateful for that. And uh, I feel like that's, you know, I always try to be very cautious with what we're saying in videos because I want to ensure that the information is always correct relating the things that they work on because we know that developers are watching. Um, so that's really important. And we actually do have numerous examples some we can't even talk about necessarily yet uh, where both stuff that we've done in the past and stuff that we're working on uh, has directly improved or influenced certain things in games uh, either before they shipped or maybe sometimes after um, you know and it's it just comes down to you know some of the things that like you can use tools for instance to profile a game and see things or like look at you can look at certain things in the art design and the pipelines and all that and see the way it is, but you need a different sort of like uh, critical eye. I think sometimes to, to pick up on certain things that might be lacking, um, especially in, you know, th there's some unique cases where that can be especially true. And I think sometimes things get missed, especially, you know, when you're developing these games, like there's a billion problems to solve and so many things that need to change, get fixed. You know, it's just, it's such a complicated process sometimes things get missed out on and uh, those little things can slip through and we've been able to help out uh, by highlighting this stuff often pre-release and ensure that when the players actually get the games, it's uh, better, <laughs> basically. Yeah, I mean, I think the quality of some of the interviews you've done recently has been uh, really sort of elevated the stuff that we're putting out on the channel. And I think it really wants, I think what I want to stress is that we have a very open um, conversation with developers and um, we kind of want to be seen collaborative in that kind of process. You know, for example, the Warzone, 120 hertz on PlayStation 5 doesn't work with HDR. We tested it, validated that that was the case and, you know, I sent off a message reporting that to Activision, you know, so they know about it before the video comes out. And, you know, hopefully they can do something about it. I mean, there's been numerous examples of that where, you know, there's nothing to lose by giving developers a heads up on what we're doing or findings that we've found. And yes, that is deeply appreciated. appreciated. And, um, you know, feeds back into the coverage at, at some point. And I just really love the stuff that you did, for example, with um, 
uh, Insomniac, with um, Ratchet and Clank, with Moon Studio, with Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Um, this is just a really good example of how we can take some of these discussions that we have behind the scenes and turn it into really compelling content. And uh, yeah, just basically elevates what we do. Um, yeah, so I'm sure that there's plenty of people that don't like what we do. <laughs> you know, and that's absolutely fine. That's, that's normal. <laughs> um, <I> mean, <laughs> but, you know, it's, you know, that's the way things are. And um, but I think the bottom line is, is, is that if we find something in a game that we find uh, that is an issue, I don't see any problem at all in giving the developer the heads up before time, sharing findings. Fundamentally, we're, we're not like a review channel, really. Like, that's not what this is about. This is about shining a light on cool technology, discussing what makes it interesting, you know, and also highlighting sometimes when there are flaws. But uh, I don't think gotchas are valuable to anyone outside of getting clicks, right? Like, we're not here to, like, spring stuff on these developers and be like, oh, look what you guys missed. Uh, that's that's That sucks. Like, nobody wants to deal with that. It's not even good for any of the potential, like, you know, people playing these games. Like, you want to try to make sure it's good to be helpful and collaborative, as you say, Rich. Exactly, yeah. I think that's the, the bottom line there. Um, but... <laughs> Edwin's question here: Do you think your reputation is that of crazy fog racer or of crisis? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what to make of that. What are we best known for? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that pretty much sums that one up. Really, I mean, um, uh, you're right, John. Um, it's we aren't really a typical review channel, and in terms of the the sort of gotcha stuff, you end up in an adversarial relationship with people that are doing amazing work and uh, by all means if there's something wrong with a particular game you know we are going to highlight it because the, you know the user experience comes first but again you know no reason at all why we can't go to the developer and say hey look this is what we're going to be saying about your game yeah people doing coverage of games there's so many different categories of that you know obviously there's like the news guys like the jason schreiers out there uh, and they sometimes can have an adversarial relationship with developers because of the nature of what they do. That's completely different from what we do, essentially. Yeah. It's yeah. good. It's still important work that oh, being that's, done by that's, them. Though, that, no, no, no. Not, it, not to minimize not that. Open. It's very important work. Yeah. It's just very different. There's a lot of different types. And, you know, we all approach it differently. I, th I think one part of uh, his question, though, uh, of being more and more mentioned in podcasts and blogs and stuff. I think that's just also tied to kind of uh, from like early this year when we started doing this uh, direct show weekly and stuff, we've opened up more to the public and to developers, you know, our channel and we've become a little bit more relatable. It wasn't that we didn't want to before, obviously, but it's just with time and the support program, we've, you know, we have the space to do it now. So I think this is also part of why Digital Foundry's name is kind of going, you know, a little bit further. And for me, it's been fun to introduce the show in Japan because after I joined, I've been sending links over to developers there and to explain stuff and whatnot. And it's very interesting to see the differences in how they uh, read us than, uh, you know, the coverage they get in Japan. So, yeah, it's fun to see the F grow. Absolutely. So I think that's all the questions we got time for, and we're actually over time. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Lots to talk about this week. Lots to talk about next week. And we'll be back then. And um, uh, for now, please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content. Ring the bell for instant notifications uh, whenever we drop new content. Did and you just say instant, Rich? No, yeah, uh, was instant. it? It is instant. I mean, as long as yes. the systems are fully instant. armed and operational, <laughs> it's instant. It's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, but um, yeah, the DF supporter program, tons going on there. Do investigate that. And uh, I'm sure you won't be disappointed. But that's all from us for now. So thanks for everyone for joining me on this one. And we will be back next week. Thanks for watching.